I'm Eric Chemi, and this is Politely Pushy. I'm excited for this week's episode because I've got two of my favorite people here, Mega and Ruben. They are the the leadership of social media at at Boast, but I think that's right. Like social leadership, the VPs, the the big shots here. You're the the two smartest people about social media that I know because I don't know that much about it. Oh, but, please and, give yourself some more credit than both that. Both of you are former TV journalists, right? So you come from the broadcast media side, so you understand both worlds. So today we're talking about what worked in 22, what didn't work, what do you got to look at going forward for a lot of these brands out there that are trying to get their message out there. You know, PR is not enough. Own content is not enough. Social is going to be such a big, important factor that especially, you know, what is Twitter or what does that become? How does that affect their strategy? So there's a lot to talk about. I'm going to start mega with you. One thing that you were surprised really worked this year in terms of a strategy and one that didn't work this year. Oh gosh. I mean, Ruben and I talk about this on a daily basis on what's coming up, what's like facing out and so forth. One of the things that worked is personalizing the brand. I think whenever it comes down to companies, it's an object, right? It's hard to really connect with an object. So when you have someone who is behind the brand and shining that light towards the to the account, it really increases engagement, increases the the funnel, if you want to just call it that. Um, and then in terms of what doesn't work, shoot, Ruben, there's a lot more than just one, right? Yeah, give me some, give me some uh, a top five uh, favorite hits, Ruben. I think, you know, one of the things, as Mega mentioned, that you really saw companies really wanting to personalize their brands. And the way that a lot of them approached it was very much about, you know, trying to showcase not just their employees, but how their employees are driving innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so really putting a face to those brands. I think the brands that really had a difficult time this year, especially as we were in this odd space of coming out of the pandemic, people were going back into offices, a lot of people still working from home, um, is those, uh, those companies that really tried to move very quickly past the pandemic right. and try to focus on, you know, everybody's back in the office. Well, that's not the reality. Uh, for a lot of people that were seeing that on social, right. it, it was very kind of felt very disconnected um, and felt like companies were a little tone deaf, frankly, about the way that, you know, people were working now. Right. Because they're, they're not all in the office and they don't want to all be in the office and they may it's never, changed. at least not it's in this changed. generation. Yeah, a lot of things have changed from behavior wise. I mean, none of us are in an office right now, right? <laughs> Do you see my colleagues? <laughs> yeah, your colleagues, the uh, canine <laughs> colleagues. In terms of like B2B tech, right? We do so much with that. That's an even more difficult game because a lot of companies, they say, well, I don't need social, right? My, my customers are businesses, right? My customers are not end consumers. You must hear that all the time. How do you get over that hurdle? One, and then number two, how do they do social? Is it different than a B2C company? Yes. I'll start off with, you know, the people who make, the people behind the business, the people who make those decisions, like, are the people. So it is a collection of people that we're talking to. So it's it's really important specifically on LinkedIn where we can really target in terms of who we should cater this message to how do we put ads behind this is this the right message does this compel the person to take action or does it make them more curious about what we do i think our job is to really be at the right place at the right time type of thing because as people are already looking for these solutions our job is to make sure that it's it's getting in front of them to make those decisions more quickly uh in terms of other things like you know Ruben, we've talked about this, like LinkedIn is the place to be because of how, how precise it can be. Yeah, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of B2B clients make is that they think of social, um, you know, that they have to be like a B2C company. Um, mm -hmm. And so they're expecting to dive into social and have a million followers on Twitter tomorrow or have, you know, 500,000 engagements on their LinkedIn post. Uh, and really what's important is for them to understand that, um, you know, you can really leverage the different channels in a variety of ways to reach different target audiences. So like Mega was talking about, right, 
really thinking about using LinkedIn as a place to, you know, not just talk about the value proposition that, that you've got, um, that your product has or your service, um, that it's not just a place to kind of amplify those partnerships that you've been able to ink in a, in a very challenging year, um, but it's also a place to engage your employee base and really using it as a place where your employees you know, can come together. We talked about you know, some, some people are back in an office, some are working from home. And so really thinking about LinkedIn as almost like that town square for your employees, right? Um, and then also thinking about Twitter, a, a lot going on with Twitter. Well, I'm sure we'll get to that a in a little while. Time out before you do Twitter, because I, I just, well, then, Twitter's a whole thing. Yeah, get the town square thing. for your employees, LinkedIn, you mentioned the employees part. But if I'm, let's say, a naive marketer, am I just thinking, I don't need to sell my employees. Like, I need to sell customers, right? Do you get that kind of a pushback? Like, I'm not worried about my employees. My metric is sales and growth and data. Right. I'm not HR. How do you combat that, that thought process? It's a whole I'm unit, right, Ruben? It's a whole thing where it comes to acquisition, engagement, onboarding, retention. It all follows that same sales pipeline. And to keep your customers happy, who's going to do all the legwork? It's your teammates. So empowering them. I think one of the things that, that people tend to forget is that three years ago, we were all going out to um, customer events. We were all attending conferences. And so we were all able to have those one-on-one -on -one touch points with our prospects, uh, with people at other companies, with people that, you know, potentially we could partner with. We don't have that really right now, and we haven't had it for the past two years. And so the way that a lot of people are thinking about those connections is that they're going to your LinkedIn page and looking to see who your employees are, who your salespeople are, what they're talking about on social. Um, you know, it really is an opportunity for them to share their thought leadership. You know, whereas if you think about it, you know, three years ago, they were sharing their thought leadership on a stage at AWS or mm. at CES. And those opportunities really haven't been there. So it's another way to, to form those connections that are so important. Um, every stat that we read says that, you know, the more that you're able to connect with a person at a company, the more likely you are to use them, you know, for their product or service that they might be, you know, trying to get in front of you. You mentioned stats, because we'll get to Twitter in a second, but you mentioned stats. I, I was curious with everything that's changed so far, are you looking at different metrics, right? Like, are you measuring different things because you don't have that stage, right? At a conference, you're using social for different reasons. How are the metrics different now than let's say 12 months ago? I think a lot of it was really about, you know, how many people, how many people can we reach? And that goes back to thinking about B2B social as B2B, B2C social. And, and that's not really the way that we are thinking about it. We are thinking about, you know, you might have 50 or 100 likes on a post, but are those the right 50 or 100 people that are liking your content? So is it is it those prospects that you're trying to get in front of? You know, you can do obviously paid social but are those people organically finding the content that you're sharing? Um, and then keeping track of that, you know, to us, it's not really about, you know, reaching hundreds of thousands of people. It's reaching a hundred of the right people. Uh, and I think that's how we approach it. And the, the players that are doing B2B social correctly, that's how they're thinking about it. Can you give some names? Who's, who's doing it correctly? Who can you share publicly? You asked for it, Ruben. <laughs> uh, I think that, you know, there's definitely those companies that you, when you go to their channels, you can very quickly see that they're not just pushing content out, uh, that they're also very much engaging with their audience. Uh, I won't name any names because uh, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but it, it's very easy to see, uh, you know, if you go and you like a post from a company and then they quickly go back and either comment on what you've said or they like your comment. Um, right. I think that makes all the difference in a world where um, it really is all about engagement. And I think that's kind of where, where it's going to lead in, in the next few years. What about Radio Shack? If anyone doesn't know, right, they've got a very aggressive social media approach that is 
either borderline offensive or actually offensive, depending on who you are. And it rubs people the wrong way, but they're getting attention. They're getting engagements. They're out there. How far does getting engagement, getting eyeballs, how far does that go? Obviously they're B2C, right? So maybe mm-hmm. it doesn't work in a B2B world, but they are even within their own industry, taking it to the far extreme. I think, I think in a B2C, really what you've seen is a reflection of what you've seen on television, right? If you think about the, the cable networks, they've very much taken a very um, extreme view of things in order to capture that audience that is interested in that particular type of content. Uh, and so uh, when you're thinking about a B2C brand, a lot of them need to do that to differentiate, to stand out, to show personality. Um, as we think about the B2B brands that we work with, we we aren't necessarily trying to get a ton of eyeballs. We're just trying to get in front of those eyeballs um, that are going to consider um, the product or service that our client is offering and also understand that, um, you know, there's value there, that there is... Um, a certain amount, a certain level of um, making sure that we're, you know, doing things right. That there's that trust aspect that's also there. Uh, and How do you so measure that's trust, though? very different. How do you measure trust? Right, like you talked about stats earlier. We know that what's measured makes progress. I know that's something that Meg has talked about before, right? That's certainly a mantra that you have with your clients, but right. but you, how do you measure some of these intangibles, right? Or maybe it's six months down the road, maybe. They say, hey, we're not seeing the results, right? We brought you in. We're not seeing the results, but it's all happening. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like a weight loss program. Like I know you can't. Yeah, it's kind of like a causation correlation type of thing, right? So, I mean, there is that flaw with social. There are improvements as far as adding CRMs um, integrated into social. So you can create a pipeline and sales pipeline for that. So you can build that relationship and actually measure it. That's really great because then we can create, you know, a follow like mega is liking this particular post and then mega then follows and subscribes to the newsletters. All of that stuff is measured. It's really fantastic. The other piece of the puzzle, whenever it comes down to the relationship aspect of it, like Ruben had mentioned it earlier, it's a two way street. It's not really about volume all the time. It's about really catering that quality over quantity. And I would say that's where the sentiment comes in. That's are, are people using more of our, are we, are we tagging more? Are we engaging on our campaigns using our hashtags? There are so many other ways to measure that progress, but it really goes into going back to like the radio shack and everything that you're talking about really honing into that client or that company's brand values and tone because that's where all the the framework and writing and character really gets built um, and, and where we align there. If there was only one metric for a company to try to improve next year, what is that metric? Three, two, one. Engagement. Engagement. Okay. Easy, easy budget. How should they look at budgeting for social, whether that's agency fee promotion, you know, paid promotional posts, right? Like boosting posts, you know, buying ads on social. How should that number look next year in a world that is recessionary? This is totally my opinion. That's what I'm just here for opinions, right? This is my opinion, right? (laughs) So the, the way that I look at a recession actually has been deeply planted from a long, long time ago where my uncle or my mom's friend was saying, you know, you have to look for opportunities when people are, are essentially going the opposite direction. Right look right. the op- op- opposite opposite direction. And this could be a great way where if if budgets are tight and you've been saving, this is a good time to really put that money to good use for brand awareness. You know, this is a good time where things might be on sale, for example, um, and to really double down because it's it's hard to put a concrete number, but I would say marketing and and social plays a really, really critical role now because e-commerce, social commerce, they're they're booming and they're gonna grow over the next, you know, five, 10 years because it removes a lot of that barrier from from shopping essentially, right? 
And so how can we really incorporate that into our social plans and not ignore it? Because the, this, you know, the stigma of social was that it's really just an add on. It's something that my so and so fill in the blank can do. It's something super fun and easy, but not really. There's a lot of thought and process that goes behind it. And it can make or break your your business also. I think um, one of the things that uh, you know a lot of B two B companies really need to think about as they go into the next year is how valuable uh, their spend uh, uh, is and what they're getting for it. Right. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, if we think about an integrated communication strategy, that's PR, that's owned content, that's social. Um, and really where I, th I think there's going to be the biggest opportunity is in social um, buying ads for paid much less expensive than going out and buying a billboard on uh, the 101. Um, also less expensive than taking out a full page ad on, in the New York Times. Uh, and also easier to measure. Uh, yes. You can very easily track, you know, who is engaging with that ad, who's looking at it, who's reading that white paper that you've uploaded or, or that video <laughs> tutorial that you've shared. Uh, and so you're getting, a, you'll get a much bigger bang for your buck. Uh, than in the past. Um, if you're really thinking about where you're going to spend your dollars and cents in 2023, I would strongly recommend that you consider maybe shifting some of that ad spin that you were going to do out of home or, you know, digital uh, and thinking about, you know, really leveraging some of those great opportunities on social. What are you hearing now about Twitter? Oh, go ahead, Mega. Go I was going to say open. strongly bold underline like strongly <laughs> consider <laughs> consider it strongly consider is that you know in school when we had to put a chapter header and it's like make it an 18 point font and bold it and italicize make it, it 22 it's like we don't need all of that yeah you mentioned twitter uh Ruben, but i didn't want to like derail the whole conversation so i wanted to save it what is your thought process what's going on here right like some people love what's happening. Some people hate it. Look, just it's November 1st. We're recording this. A lot's going to change. Every minute something changes between recording and posting. How are clients supposed to deal with this? How are they supposed to figure out, hey, I need to set a budget and I need to budget number now to decide how we're spending next year, but I don't even know what Twitter is going to be. So should I just put everything into LinkedIn, wait and mm -hmm. see on Twitter? What's, what's the strategy here? So I think for any any B2B company that's thinking about, you know, what their spend is going to be on Twitter or LinkedIn, I think that's a, a poor approach. I think the way that you really need to be thinking about it is you need to be ready to, you know, say, I'm going to spend X, Y, and Z on each of these platforms for a month. Um, and then I'm going to adjust and optimize my spend based on which platform is giving me the best ROI. So, uh, you know, as you think about kind of your bucket of money, I think that's how you should be thinking about it is one of the things that we're always doing here at Bospar is testing. We do a ton of A-B testing on social. We do a lot of testing on different platforms with different creative. Uh, and you really need to be prepared to do that to really identify what's going to perform the best for you. I think one of the ad campaigns that we were really surprised by this year was with one of our clients um, that had brought in a mega celebrity uh, to, to work with them, uh, to invest in their company. Um, and then, you know, we said, okay, we're going to take some of the content that we've got with this celebrity and we're going to put some paid spend behind it, uh, thinking that we were just going to kind of go through the roof with um, impressions and engagements. Um, and then we said, you know, why don't we take that test and pair it with a test on uh, somebody that's been working with the company that's very familiar with what they do, that really um, understands um, the audience that they're trying to reach. And let's see which one performs better. Uh, and to our surprise, uh, the, the mega celebrity um, didn't perform quite as well. Uh, and so you really need to be willing to do a lot of that testing. Why was that? What, why do you, why was that surprise? Like, or why did the mega celebrity, that's, that's why they bring these mega celebrities in, right? Is to get that engagement. And if it's not there, like what's going on? Uh, uh, the connection, I, I, I think it was much easier for the audience to connect with the person that has kind of a long affiliation with what the company does and, 
you know, how, how that person um, connects to uh, what the company does is, is extremely important. And so we won't get into talking about influencers and how you use them in this, in this episode, but, you know, maybe we'll come back and do that another time. (laughs) I want to add to the Twitter piece. And actually, we talked about it this morning. And, you know, whenever this launches, we're hearing rumors about November 7th being a critical date for Twitter. We'll hear more about it. One of the things of of what we talked about this morning with our social team was the fact that we got to what what Ruben said, test. First of all, we can focus on what we can control and what we can focus on, what we cannot control. What we can control is that there's a lot more social media uh, accounts and platforms popping up, decentralizing social media. That That's something that we're hearing more and more. So why not take the opportunity to just make an account and lock in your names? That way, three, four, five months down the line, or if one of those platforms booms, then you're not out there fighting for a username. That's one. And then to Ruben's point, test it out. Does that work? What are the demographics? Does that make sense for your brand? Does it make sense for your business? Does it make sense for the target audience? And then in terms of Twitter, let's continue trudging it on because we need to understand how that platform adapts and changes because it's essentially popular. There's a lot of eyes on it, but also with popularity comes a lot more competition. So you'll have to really fight for that stage. So there are a couple ways, but I would say err on the you know side of diversifying your social media portfolio because you'll probably run a, a time where you kind of have to pivot a few times. We're down to the last few seconds here, our final minute lightning talk. round. Quick <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. TikTok, should companies be using TikTok to reach Anybody to reach a B2B audience? Depends. Oh, flat thumbs, <laughs> half flat thumbs. Okay, depends. Um, that may be another episode. If there's if there's budget constraints, let's say someone's watching this, they say, I love everything Ruben and Meg have to say. I'm not getting any more budget for my CEO or for my CFO. What's one thing that they can do better right now for next year with no additional dollars? I think one of the things that's easiest to do is is just do an an audit uh, of your current platforms. Mm -hmm. What are you doing on them? And what are your competitors doing? And where is the white space and the opportunity in 2023 that you can take advantage of something that no one else is doing? Uh, And, you know, I think that's one of those things where you don't need extra, extra dollars to do that. Uh, You may need a little bit of extra time, uh, but, you know, it's one of those things when your CEO and and CEOs of companies are constantly looking at their social channels. So uh, once your CEO sees that you're doing something creative and interesting, uh, there, there might be a little bit of loosening of the purse strings for you. I'm a big proponent of building authentic relationships. So quality over quantity, focus on content that resonates with the audience and with the time that you can save, whether it's listening to keywords, to competitors, to engaging with folks, sending them direct messages. What what you think through the audit uh, would be successful would be my path because it doesn't necessarily mean to be pushing, pushing content it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the results that you're looking for. Everyone's got content. There's too much content. Think about how much we all get in our inboxes, right? In our social media feed. It's it's too much to keep up with. Mega, Ruben, I love talking to you. We should do this more often, like a monthly check. We say that all the too. time. You two Let's are do so it. Busy, Let's make though. it happen. You two are yeah. too busy. I'm around. You guys have a lot of work to do dealing with all these companies that need your help. Mega, Ruben, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time today. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thank you to my guest and thanks for listening. Subscribe to get the latest episodes each week and we'll see you next time.